Hello, my name is John Reynolds. On this episode of Extraordinary Life Stories, I'm talking to Jeff Mostyn. Jeff is known throughout the whole of the football community, having been chairman of AFC Bournemouth Football Club until earlier this year. Jeff's story is incredible, from saving AFC Bournemouth from potential financial disaster to guiding the club to the summit of English football, playing in the Premier League. I know Jeff personally as a friend. For a relatively small stature, he has an enormous heart and the warmest of personality. I want to know how someone just so lovely has been able to be so successful and so loved in the world of football that can be so cutthroat and brutal. I also want to know how Jeff has been able to manage the change of identity from chairman of the club for so long and what Jeff is doing now. Because the Jeff I know is not someone that has any plans on retiring anytime soon, if ever. I'm really looking forward to my conversation with Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Tell me, who is Jeff Mostyn? That's a very interesting question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. Um, I think Jeff, Happy to be the first. You ha- yeah, you know, you're always the, you're always the first with, uh, with questions. Um, I think Jeff Mostyn is um, a humble individual that um, has had a very strange um, journey from childhood to where I am now. But I like to think that I'm, apart from being one of the most emotional people that God's ever put on the planet, I like to think I'm a good person uh, that inspires others. And certainly in my time at the moment, that is something that's very high on my agenda. Yeah, it's an emotional time for you. I'm going to come back to that. I want to go back to Jeff growing up. What, you, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Well, I wanted to be a footballer. Um, I think it was all I knew and probably, you know, without even thinking about it, almost subliminally, you know, it actually took me into the world of football many years, many years on. Um, Unfortunately, I played for the school. I played for the county. Never good enough to be professional. Um, And uh, but I got as far as I could and I had, you know, my ambition. And within ambition, you have to know your own limitations. And I certainly knew mine. That's interesting. So actually, in context, you, would, you could see that, that there was a major ambition and a desire to be a footballer, and you, you didn't achieve that. But you pivoted to ultimately become involved in football. Tell me about that journey. How did that ultimately happen? Well, I think the journey sort of started again, um, people have said subliminally. You know, when I um, was um, young, I didn't go to school. Um, for the vast majority of the time, I've often joked with people, you know, to say that I left school at 15 with no qualifications other than a degree in truancy. Um, but the, the issues were surrounded by bullying um, and it wasn't something that I wanted to um, tolerate every day of my life. And as a very keen football fan, I used to go to football grounds and collect autographs, predominantly Manchester City, Manchester United and born and bred in Manchester. And then when I collected the autographs, I used to go into school to sell them in order to get enough money to go to the matches. And when I went to the away matches, I used to collect programs, go back into school and sell the programs in order to get enough money to go to the next match. So there was a businessman, an entrepreneur right there with a drive to get to football. And yet at the time, you don't, you, you, it just it was something that came naturally yeah. to me. So I had no idea that, I mean, I don't think the word entrepreneur uh, was part of anybody's vocabulary. You know, when I went to school, you know, we're now talking about when I left school at 15, um, that was in 1960. Right, right. Interesting. Interesting because you weren't inspired at school and you were running away from bullying and yet then you very much channeled the entrepreneurial side that we understand that is now into business. And business is what got you into football, got you into your beloved AFC Bournemouth. It's one hell of a story and I'll let you tell it. Yes, I think that, you know, from, you know, we, we've just sort of concluded at, you know, the age of you know 15 and start the journey again. Yeah. For many years, I was a little bit of a, you know, Jack the Lad selling anything that I could, you know, make some money on, you know, whatever it, you know, it happened to be. But yeah. I think, you know, I enjoyed the journey of life. Um, you know, some people went to university. I would probably went to the street university, you know, where I learned to be university able to. Life. The university of life. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, where I learned to be able to communicate, you know, yeah. with people at all levels. And um, eventually, as I already alluded to, you have to grow up. And round about the age of um, sort of mid-30s, I decided to study finance 
uh, because a lot of my friends were financial advisors. Um, and um, I proved that I, you know, I could study even at a later age. Uh, became a fully qualified financial advisor. And in 1988, I set up a business uh, with um, two partners from a previous business yep. uh, where we were all directors of the previous business, but probably ministers without portfolio because along with the staff, we weren't being paid a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Right. So in 1988, we started our own business, providing financial advice to members of the armed forces uh, on a global basis. Um, and over the next 25 years, we became, you know, one of the leading independent brokers providing financial advice to members of the armed forces. And this, you know, this gave me an amazing amount of joy and pride because to be allowed inside the wire, um, whether it was in the United Kingdom, whether it was in Cyprus, Hong Kong, Germany, Northern Ireland, throughout the Troubles, we were providing a service for people who really deserved it. Yeah. Um, you know, members of the armed forces. And I, I started to learn during that process my love of charity, you know, my, and now this sort of gift of giving. Sure. Um, my sister um, developed polio at the age of 13. She was paralyzed from the waist down. And during that period, I'm just sort of, you know, slightly going back on a tangent. Um, I became a little bit of a loose cannon because we were very, very close. But like, you know, you alluded to the fact that, you know, my entrepreneurial skills came out yeah. at a very early age, but I didn't realize it was anywhere like her business sense. Also, my love and desire to help people who were uh, not as fortunate as me um, probably started with um, my sister and looking after her. Right. So during my time at the armed forces, once every other week, um, I used to visit the injured soldiers um, and um, s particular soldiers at Selly Oak Hospital and Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, where they were repatriated. The vast majority amputees following the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And there wasn't a single visit. I was one of only a handful of civilians allowed um, on the wards. And it was incredible. I used to go back to my car and I come back to my emotional, you know, God's m most emotional child. Uh, I used to literally break down in the car. But I was so motivated by the people that I was talking to, people with multiple amputees who never complained whether they'd lost um, one limb, two limbs, three limbs. They never complained about what they lost. They concentrated on what they had. That's interesting. It was incredible. No, and what it. a driver that was for me. Yeah, inspiration. For, totally inspirational. Yeah, yeah. I, we, I actually interviewed someone called David Butler, who's a triple amputee. And I took him back to 11 years old when the mortar that exploded that blew him to pieces. And I, and I said, would you change anything on that day to allow you to have the life you could have had? And he said, I wouldn't change a thing. Resilience. And the strength that he got, you know, is incredible. Whereas there are people that seem to struggle with far less things that have happened to them. But no, I totally get, you know, I can see, I can see just sitting with you here now, the, the emotional side of it. It's choking me as well. It's amazing how inspirational people can shape your career. And you've gone on to help so many people. The amount of charities, foundations you're involved with and chairman of is probably more than I can name on both my hands. You, know, I, you carry that all the way through your life, right? Thank you. I, you know, I'm still, my parents taught me always to say please and thank you and be humble. Yeah. Um, and I've never got above my station. Um, you know, I bless them both and I'm sure they're looking down on me now and making sure that I remain humble because if I wasn't, they'd be throwing bolts of lightning down just to remind me, you know, who I am. You know, I work in uh, or, you know, have done in a quite an egotistical world of sure. sport. And it's very hard sometimes to keep your feet on the floor. Yeah. Uh, but I'm constantly reminding others um, that, you know, you are a humble individual setting an example for others to follow. Yeah. And I think, you know, we know each other outside of this interview. Like we know a lot of the same people. And the thing that I find just a constant is the love that people have got for you. And, you know, you were, were sort of, we fast forwarded to go back. You know, you were chairman of AFC Bournemouth, you know, top man in a, in a incredibly competitive, brutal you know, business, if you like, and you're loved 
and you seem to have kept that empathy and that uh, relationship where everyone in the club, you know, you knew their names, probably gave them a hug every morning. You know, how have you managed that? How have you, how have you managed to, to be humble and someone that's so loved in such a brutal environment? Well, I think, again, it comes down to being grounded and respecting everybody that you work with. And I was asked recently, you know, what my greatest attributes were. Mm. And um, I've never, I've never self-analyzed myself to fully understand just what my attributes are. And I don't like talking about myself. I always feel other people, you know, I'm always happy to take compliments. I'm happy I'm, to do I'm, that. I'm always happy, <laughs> you know, to take, you know, criticism yeah. as long as it's, you know, fair uh, and responsible, you know, criticism. But I think God gave me two gifts. First of all, he gave me the greatest amount of enthusiasm that he ever gave anybody on the 21st of September 1945 when yeah. I was born. And he also gave me this uncanny ability to make the vast majority of people that I meet feel special. You can't be everybody, everything to everybody. So that's why I say the vast majority. And I think that during my tenure at the football club, you know, in particular as chairman, um, I try to go to every department every day and tell people how valued they were and make them feel special. Of course, you can do this at AFC Bournemouth with respect, you know, we're not going at Old Trafford or the Etihad um, or the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium where, you know, it would take you a week to get round every department. Sure. You know, we have an intimate group of people and we're a family community club. Yeah. And I get, no, I get so much thrill out of making people feel special. Even now, you know, on a match day, um, when uh, I'm approached by supporters, um, they get the great Jeff hug. Um, and it's something that I love doing because I know the thrill that it gives them as well as the thrill that it gives me. Yeah. And I'm honored. I'm honored, humbled and flattered when people come and want to talk to me. Yeah as opposed to they think it's special for them. Yeah, and I've had conversations as random as, because um, we obviously don't live too far away from each other, and I had something needed fixing in the house, the plumber came around, and somehow in conversation it, it came up that I was interviewing you, and the guy could not have gushed more about just what he's done for the club, and so on. but then it was Jeff, it was about Jeff, and, and what I'm interested in is that, you know, you, you said we then, referring to the club, you're still a fan, you're still part of the club in, in some way as well, but you're not the chairman anymore. And there must have been a massive separation of identity, which again, I know that's emotional for you, let alone it's, it's the principle of what happened, that be, you know, being at the club every day, working with people you clearly loved, and then actually separating. How has that been for you? It's probably been the most emotional six months of my life. And anybody that knows me, you know, the, the, the football club is, is my family. Um, it always will be, you know, along with, you know, my wife who has been, you know, Rosie has been by my side. Um, well, we've been married 42 years, but every single step of the journey at the football club, she's hosted every match that we've ever played um, at the Vitality Stadium in the boardroom with me, making people feel special. It's like people are visiting our house. Oh, yeah. So suddenly uh, when um, the new owner, Bill Foley, took over, he made it quite clear, and obviously it's his prerogative, and I fully understand um, investing so much money, he would want to be the chairman of the football club. And there was some irony that probably the only casualty, you know, in the takeover was going to be the chairman because there could only be one, and that sure. just happened to be me. So even during the period where Bill very kindly offered me the opportunity to be the club ambassador, it was still very, very hard, very emotional, because, you know, uh, I, you're not involved in the club anymore. Um, and it's not like a normal business. No, you, know, you, you lived and breathed it, right? Every single day, you know, six days a week. I remember Eddie Howe saying to me, you know, Chairman, you know, aren't you having a day off? You know, you travel with the team to every away game, sometimes... You know, Rose and I were the only two representing the club yeah. at various games. Uh, the players are off, hypothetically, on a Monday. Why are you in the football club? And what would I do at home? You know, th this is my responsibility, you know, as the chairman, even though um, the delegated responsibility of running the business on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, was down to the chief executive and the executive team or the management team. Yeah. I still felt that even if I was just giving people a hug and telling them how important they were, 
you know, that is an intangible benefit to the business. Um, and I use the word business because people often mistake um, us for a, for a football club. And there is a clue in the word, in, you know, in the word because we are a football club, but fundamentally we're a business yeah. in the business of playing football. I get it. So the last six months, and in particular from um, the end of the season when I, July, so it's only recently now that I've officially stepped back. <clears throat> I'm still providing, you know, support for Steve Cuss, um, our head of the community and head of our women's team, um, because I love the work in the community. And I'm really grateful that Steve has, you know, allowed me to continue to be an ambassador for, you know, for him and the uh, and the team. So I still have that connection. But emotionally, um, I was in a really bad place. One thing is absolutely certain and cast in stone. I could not have had this conversation with you, you know, certainly for the purpose of today. Yeah. Um, prior to today. I know. I'm now in a very good, strong um, understanding of my role. And I think also you mentioned, um, you know, in the question that mm. how do you separate being chairman? Yeah, the identity. Uh, to, to the, the identity. That was the thing that was a traumatic for me yeah. because you think you're chairman of the, the a Premier League football club. You're one of only 20 individuals, literally. You know, you can be El Grande and say it's globally, obviously, because, yeah. you know, the three billion people or more watching the Premier League, everybody would stop and talk to me wherever I, wherever I am. Yeah. You know, when I had the privilege of speaking to delegates in um, 2019 um, at the United Nations General Assembly um, or delegates from the United Nations General Assembly, I said to them, I speak two languages fluently. I speak fluent football and I speak fluent English. Um, and everybody, literally, it was like a round of applause. Yeah. But it is, it's the international language. So now that I'm no longer chairman, who am I? I could come back to the first question that you asked me yeah. and ask you, who is Jeff Mostyn? Mm. Um, I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah. This is your baby, not mine. Yeah. So, but that is a reality of having to try and find my identity. And I won't name names, but a very prominent um, uh, person in football, I was had the privilege of joining at the uh, Qatar World Cup, said to me, amongst his peer group, which was the managers, yeah. and he identified, these are not your peers, these are my peers. They love you, not because you're chairman of AFC Bournemouth. They love you because you're Jeff Mostyn. Yeah. And it was a moment that it was like um, a, a whole weight had suddenly come off my shoulders and thought, oh, my God, I, people are still going to talk to me. They're going to seek my advice. They're going to want my support. And the fact that I'm no longer chairman of AFC Bournemouth is absolutely irrelevant. It's the person yeah. that I think they um, admire and respect, or I hope so. Once again, I'm only talking about the vast majority because you're always going to get you know, people who dislike you for who you are, what you are, what you stand for. And that's everybody's individual prerogative. Yeah. That's why life is so exciting yeah. at times and difficult at others. I'm so but glad I, whoever it was that said that. Um, clearly had some influence because if you needed to hear it, I'm glad you did. And if you had asked me, it would have been very little about football and a lot yeah. about Jeff. It was an exorcism. And you, what you've got there, I mean, I, I can only empathise and imagine from the players, um, and not just football, right? You know, someone in Formula One that's been cheered and ad, you know, adulation for 15 years, and then they stop. You know, it must be a really difficult thing to separate. And, and of course, there is also the element of how much time and effort have you thought about what you're going to do next? Um, we're actually filming in the Jack studio, J-A-A-Q, just to ask a question, the social media mental health platform. That whole mental health space that we're kind of talking about here, you know, um, what do you think of Jack? I absolutely love it, you know, and adore it. And, um, you know, I, I was honoured again and flattered that you know, you spoke to me and asked if it's something that I would champion. And, you know, this stems from my time at the football club. So as chairman of the football club, I was also the, the board equality champion. 
Um, and I know when we got our advanced um, equality standard mm. from the Premier League, yeah. Garth Crooks was the chair. And he said in all the years that um, the standard, uh, that he has been chairing the, the standard and the awards, that I was the only Premier League chairman that had actually appeared with our, with our group in front of him. And that wow. showed my passion for equality and EDI. You know, equality, diversity, and inclusion just uh, flow from me. Um, and I loved the fact that I could make an influence or become an yeah. influence at the football club and the community, championing it as chairman of the football club. Yeah. I now know that I can carry on my work um, just having stepped back. Yeah. And, you know, what, you know, what I understood about Jack, I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? You know, yeah. when you actually think about mental health, you know, what is mental health? You know, it's just sometimes it's a word that is used in vogue. You know, people actually will, you know, use it as part of their current in vogue vocabulary yeah. that we champion or mental it's health. Box. It's a tick, you know. Yeah. I mean, in every walk of life now, sport in particular, compliance rules. Yeah. So let's tick that box, you know. But what is it? And probably until I got involved in uh, Jack, um, I had very little or no idea of the difficulty, hypothetically, that, you know, um, whether it was women um, um, suffering from menopause, where would they go? So let's Google menopause. Oh, here we are. We've got 61,000 hits. Yeah. Which one of those do you choose? Which one's reliable? And, and, and reliable, exactly. So first of all, yeah. you have to choose one unless it's been referred to you um, as you say, is it reliable, unreliable? And then suddenly, right out of the blue, this dream, you know, where you can just, you know, Google Jack. Um, and within that, you will have the greatest panel of medical experts. But not only that, people that you can relate to. It's not just celebrities. It's not just A-list people. It's people like you and me yeah. who have suffered various issues during their life. In my case, I could talk about bullying and the effect it had on me. And people will, you know, take that on board. You're not alone. So whether you, whether it matters or it doesn't matter, the fact you're not alone, that lifts a certain percentage of fear um, that you're in this little bubble alone yeah. and nobody cares. Yeah. And then, of course, simultaneously, you're able to get advice from people who you should listen to. These are the consultants, the physicians yeah. who are experts in their field. So it's a one-stop shop. For me, it's the Google of the future. Yeah, no, you've articulated that so well. Um, from a mental health point of view and looking at kind of sport and football, because you've got such a far-reaching influence in view, how have you seen the, the kind of um, need for mental health and the implementation of you know, EDI and more HR resources coming in to help because there's there's a crushing scenario where you know if you're not good enough you're out in kind of all all sort of stages of the, the sport and across all sport. Have you seen that massively improving and a more of a support network in place? Um, yes, yeah. you know, and um, you know, I'm proud of the work that AFC Bournemouth do. Mm. You know, obviously that's not my remit anymore. Um, what the future plans are in terms of development, of course, are it's, it's Bill's responsibility now yeah. and the executive. But, you were there building but the I was there building the foundations. Sure. We've got the most incredible, you know, team of safeguarding um, of EDI um, and, and mental health support, absolutely first class, and it transcends both the players um, and the staff. The pressure of maintaining your status in the Premier League. I cannot even begin to describe the pressure on everybody. How would you define success as we sit here now? Well, um, I think from a, um, a professional point of view, the fact that you know, success is measured by your status and the fact that we're in you know, the Premier League um, you know, can be easily judged as having a successful road. But I think for me, the platform of respect um, that is um, evident you know, at the football club, amongst the supporters, amongst the staff, amongst the players, amongst the community, amongst the charities. You know, from when I first got involved in the football club, which was going out of business as is well documented yeah. in 2006, 2007, 
you know, I was practically delivering mail because, you know, we couldn't afford a first class stamp. To where it is now, we haven't just taken the sporting journey, we've taken the backstory journey. And I think we are one of the most respected football clubs. I say globally, you know, we're not a, a global superstar football club, but wherever we travel, wherever the team travel, I've always thought we're probably a very high percentage of supporters' second favourite team. And it's not just the team, the performance, it's the club. I know that when people have left our football club, having been entertained, you know, by me and my wife, when we were involved as chairman yeah. and hosts, everybody thought that this was the best afternoon they'd ever had in their life. And I remember, um, you know, Ed Woodward saying to me after Manchester United, where we'd beaten Manchester United. Um, so, you know, I was on the ceiling and obviously Ed was on the, uh, the opposite yeah. side on the floor. But he was just so um, humble when he came back into the boardroom and said, Jeff, I'm obviously disappointed, you know, with the, the, perform the day's work on the pitch. But he said, your hospitality today, he said, we stay in seven star hotels, we're treated, you know, with a red carpet everywhere we go in the world. I mean, probably the biggest football club on earth yeah, uh, and the most recognizable brand on earth. But he said, today, I feel that I've been to your house with you and Rose for Sunday lunch. I love that. And that's just, and that, that's that's relationship. That was just oh my god! I literally yeah. this is you know the chief executive of Manchester United at the time, yeah. you know, saying this to me in the boardroom where people are talking about little old Bournemouth and you know it's Jeff and I just couldn't. Be, I was in awe of some of the people that we were hosting. Yeah, and then you beat them. <laughs> well, let's not <laughs> on that occasion. Let's not dwell on that. No, I think I want to win friends and influence yeah, people, especially as, especially as a Mancunian. <laughs> Bro, true, true. That, but you're all right. The amount of people because I live down that way, and I've I've lived through the whole journey, you know. And it, people smile. I'm doing it now. People smile at just what happened there from buying the club for one pound to taking it to the Premiership and it, you know, leaving mm. with it. Firmly yeah. in there. I don't remember the one pound, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, taking we'll it from, a few zeros on, but yeah, yeah, it was the love. And as I think I've said to you before, I bought the club with my heart, not my head. Yes, um, probably, and I got out of jail free um, because of the people that I met on the way, the journey, the management team. Jeff, from from a, a point of view from the administration, when the club was in a very difficult position, difficult time. There was a pivotal moment that you were key to. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, um, I think you're. I think I know what you're. You know that moment you're alluding to. During the administration, I was paying the uh, wages every month of uh, the staff and the players, as well as a contribution towards the administrator, mm -hmm. who understandably wouldn't be doing his work unless he was getting paid. And um, I'd been doing this for probably close to six months, and it was a substantial amount of money. I think it was somewhere circa a hundred thousand pounds a month, and my wife and I um, had agreed that enough was enough. We were actually away in Spain because we believed the club had the administrator had found um, a buyer. Um, we got a phone call to say that it had fallen through, come back, and on this particular day, Gerald Krasner was the um, administrator, and he said to me, "Jeff, we're having the monthly press conference. You're going to stand at the back." Um, as normal. Um, I'm going to ask you for another check. Um, you're going to nod if you give me, if you want to give me the check and you're going to shake your head if you don't. And um, he said, I will literally, the club would be liquidated. We'd already been in administration once in the previous decade, uh, decade, so it wasn't going to be, you know, two administrations. This was going to be the end of round about 120, 125 years of history. As he was talking, I wasn't even listening. I was just in this daze and glaze that, you know, on my watch, and despite everything I tried to do to save the club, along with, you know, others had made contributions, including fans, um, the whole club was going to be distant and on memory. Your, on your nod, uh, like uh, the Roman uh, Exactly, just a nod. And whilst my wife and I um, had agreed that we'd done enough and, you know, we just couldn't keep putting this money into, you know, a dark hole, 
um, as his words were coming out, they were mumbled. Um, he said, Jeff, what is your decision? And I nodded. And that nod was a, effectively save the football club. You know, there is a documentary, Minus 17, that depicts this. But um, at that time, I didn't realize the significance that without that nod, the club would have been out of business. Yeah. And it may have been resurrected as other clubs have, you know, maybe 10 or 15 tiers down, seven tiers down. But the club, I do not believe, would be where it is yeah. today. You, you, you know, that ultimately affected the outcome and essentially the position of where the club is now, well, yeah. undoubtedly. Yeah. So what, what a story. Yeah. And it's something, you know, that's my legacy. It's something I'll yeah. always, always for the rest of my life, whatever happens in the future, be proud of. Yeah, and so will all AFC Bournemouth fans as well. Thank you. In context of um, Jeff moving forwards now, what's next for you? Yeah. What's the well, next chapter? I love the charity uh, work that I, uh, that I do. Um, you know, I'm patron of uh, Dorset Cancer Care, a patron of Lewis Manning Hospice Care, and um, I am also an ambassador for Julius House Children's Hospice. Yeah. Um, I'm chair of the uh, BCP Council mm -hmm. Towns Fund bid, so we've, I think, brought close to 22, 23 million pounds into Boscombe in particular, where ironically the stadium is, to um, one of the most deprived areas. Um, so right. trying to deal with deprivation and put something back into the town uh, mm. is something I love. I love my public speaking. Yep. Um, I love telling the story, you know, which sort of circumnavigates and encompasses my life, the business, and uh, and the football club. I think well, it's, all interrelated. I right? think it's. I think the football story itself is one of the greatest stories ever told. I'm I, obviously. I'm, agree, I'm agreeing. Yeah, oh, thank 100%. you. I'm obviously biased. I remember the first words that came out of my mouth. I don't know where they or how they came out. But after we were promoted on that, you know, famous night, it was, you know, mathematically certain we were going to be promoted. We didn't know whether we'd be champions until the week after against Bolton. And, um, you know, I had a microphone put in front of me um, uh, by Tony Husband, I think it was, uh, yeah. for BBC Cell today. And he said, Jeff, you know, what does this mean to you? And I just said, if Hans Christian Andersen could ever have written a fairy story about football, this is the story. This Very is well the played. night. It's the greatest story ever told yeah. from a football club that was minus 17 points in Division 2 that survived with only 15 minutes to go of the final match. We didn't even get into positive points till after Christmas yeah. to then six years later get into the Premier League. I don't think what that will ever be surpassed. Imagine going to and, the bookies and uh, having a conversation oh, about yeah. the odds on that. Yeah. It's just... Crazy. Well, let me just say, for the avoidance of doubt, I was never allowed to bet as chairman of the football club. 100%. So I just cleared that up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was definitely not putting words yeah. in your mouth. But just in terms of fairy tale, in yes. terms of a great story, that was my point. And it's it's an incredible story. And you are an incredible man, Jeff. And I really appreciate you. Thank you. Spending time with me today. You're a friend outside of here. Uh, you're an inspiration to many, many people, and you're just so loved. So. Thank you for talking to me. Oh, my goodness gracious. You know, can I just say what an honour, a privilege it's been um, to be asked. And it's an honour and a privilege to have spent time with you today. Thanks, and Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for all your love oh, and support. Pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.